I'm John Buchanan, and in this video, we're going to look at Beatbreaker, which is one of the new multi effects plugins. In fact, the new multi effect plugin in the 10.8 version of Logic Pro. Now, Beatbreaker allows us to do a number of different things to audio as it plays back. It allows us to adjust individual volumes of slices of audio. It allows us to produce little repeating effects, and it allows us to manipulate pitch and time as well. And as its name suggests, it's mostly been designed um, in order to be able to kind of remix beats on the fly. However, what we're going to do in this video is to see that it's capable of much more than just that. So let's just start by listening to the beat loop we're going to be working on, which isn't being manipulated in any way, shape or form. Um, and you can see the name of the file here, B-Side Cuts Beat. If you want to go and find this particular uh, loop, it's in the Apple Loops library. And it sounds like this. Okay, nice wonky hip-hop groove. I like wonky hip-hop grooves. Drawn to them. How many times have I said that on this channel? Okay, so what we're going to do is to come down to the multi-effects uh, plugins, and in addition to fat effects and remix effects and step effects, we now have bait, uh, bait? No, beat breaker as well, which looks like this. Okay, now to make life easy, what we're going to do is to start not with time, but with the other modules that are available here, or modes if you like, which allow us to do things to beat loops in different ways. I'll come back to time because it's probably the only one that requires a little bit more explanation. The others are a bit more self-explanatory. But while we're here, let's just see exactly what we're looking at. So firstly, what I can do is to say, okay, how long is the analyzed piece of audio going to be that I want to uh, slice up into different chunks? And that is specified here. So four beats or one bar effectively means that all of these individual slices becomes an eighth note because there are eight slices. So effectively what we've got is four beats divided up into eight separate blocks. And what, as I say, we can do to each of those blocks is to either manipulate time and pitch, or we can repeat a section, or we can apply a volume change. Now you might be immediately wondering why there is a line that on some pages, like these two, runs from the bottom left hand corner up to the top right, and on the volume page is one flat line. Okay, well remember, what these allow us to do is different things to each individual slice. And volume, for instance, is going to be an offset from 0 dB. So in other words, if I don't manipulate any volume, the volume is going to remain consistently at its flat volume all the way through. Whereas if I decided that what I wanted to do is to turn down a second slice in volume by, let's say, 4 dB, then effectively, obviously, that would be a deviation away from that line. How do I know it's 4 dB? Well, in addition to the volume tab up here, what I've got is indicators here, little sort of data panes showing me a couple of important things about this individual block, and um, volume, the offset here, is showing me that as well. And I suspect that if I press Option and click again, sure enough, it jumps back to its default state. So volume is pretty self-explanatory, but it allows us to see a couple of important things about the way that we can bring uh, sort of data into Beatbreaker. So as we've already seen, what I have a chance to do is to create little volume offsets where I can just literally go through and say, okay, well, I want to interrupt the volume of the way that this loop is going to play back. But we immediately encounter our first problem. I've sort of put in this nice little wonky groove. And what that effectively means, and we can see it as we play back, is that the individual slices of the waveform don't absolutely sort of adhere to where the lines are within these slices. Now, there are a couple of things I can do about that. Firstly, what I could do would be to start thinking about how I want these lines to move through each individual block. So at the moment, they are just literally offset at static volumes. So let's suppose I want to take this slice here and I want it to have it kind of meet the final slice a little bit more musically than it is right now, rather than just kind of this cliff edge change. Well, I can do that by changing the slope. I can put slope values in in either direction. So a positive slope effectively means that the volume starts more quietly and becomes uh, louder, and a negative slope, and at the moment I'm just typing these values in, allows me to create a different value altogether. And what I can then do is to manipulate the way that these work actually by dragging from left to right as well. So if I want to manipulate the slope 
using my mouse, I can absolutely do that. And having created, I reckon it's going to be about there if I wanted to join these two bits up almost. Then um, I've got an opportunity just to manipulate that as well. And if I want to, rather than just a linear drop in volume, I can also add a curve, which allows me to just bend the way that volume is going to behave through one of these slices. So if I want to, what I can do is to create a much more musical selection of changes as far as sort of managing the volume from one slice of my audio to the next. And effectively, I can just drag these around and sort of create the shapes that I want. And of course, if I do want a jump, then of course, that's absolutely fine too. So this is my new volume shape now across four beats. Okay, so that's a nice place to start, and hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so what does repeat do? Well, th what this allows me to do is to take any individual slice and literally have it repeat. So rather than just play back in a linear way, it will effectively just create a little micro loop through that individual section. So let's just do that here. Again, here the opportunity to drag left to right is my friend. Now, one thing I would definitely say, in fact, dragging up and down is my friend. Now, one thing I would definitely say about Beat Breaker is that certainly compared to the kind of intuitive moves that you'll make with most of Logic's plugins, a little bit of experimentation. It's definitely taking quite a lot of up and down movement with the mouse or left to right movement with the mouse to kind of get the values that you want. And I think it's because this plugin has obviously been ported across from the iPad where a more tactile version makes much more sense. Doing it with the mouse, I think it's going to end up getting manipulated a little bit the way that this plugin will develop over future iterations of Logic. I might be wrong, but it definitely doesn't feel quite as smooth and intuitive as some of the other plugins. So effectively, by putting this value in here that I have, what I'm going to get is two repeats of this slice. Okay, and I think up to eight sort of repeats are available to me. Now, the first thing to say is that, of course, we've had the capability to produce processing like this in music technology for a really long time. If you want to get involved with sampling, then of course, this kind of multi-looping sort of approach has been used a lot. And in fact, actually, I would go so far to say that quite quickly, this sort of multi-repeat thing will start to sound a bit dated. Now. I don't mean that pejoratively. It could well be that the sort of music you're interested in making benefits hugely from these kind of tricks. But I think used just like this, this kind of repeat process is a bit less interesting than maybe it was when we first heard it 20, 30 years ago. However, this gives me a really useful opportunity to bring in one of my favorite features within Beat Breaker, which is the mix control, which is up here. Now, part of the reason why this feels so heavy-handed, I suppose, this kind of repeat trick um, approach is because it's the whole mix which is being processed with it at the moment. The whole of the beat loop is being forced to produce this kind of massive repeat. What happens if I take the mix down to, I don't know, let's say 25%? But what that's going to do is to make 70% 75% of the volume. That was bad maths for a moment, wasn't it? 75% of the volume of this beat loop experience is going to be the original loop. And only a quarter of its volume is going to be assigned into the volume shaping we've done and to these repeats. And I think that's going to sound quite a lot better. So suddenly we've got this really subtle treatment and suddenly there's detail and kind of magic in this in a way that when it's up at 100%, there's less. I'm going to turn it back up to 100% because we're obviously shining a bit of a light on uh, Beat Breaker, but expect that mix value to come back down again before we've looked at all of these individual pieces. Okay, so we've looked at volume, we've looked at repeat, and hopefully those things make sense. I've literally got a chance to drag up and down here to increase or decrease the number of repeats I want of every individual slice. Okay, so time comes next. Now then, effectively, what this allows me to do, and by the way, it looks like I have now manipulated the time values, but effectively what that's showing me is that I've got data in from the other modules. Effectively, it's superimposed the repeat 
Um, and uh, I think just the repeat slices, in fact, on top of it. So I've still got a chance to make changes here, but at the moment we haven't actually added any from our time perspective. Okay, again, I'm gonna press play. And this time what I'm gonna draw your attention to is this little running sort of waveform analysis, which is happening up the left-hand side of this plugin. <laughs> So what that's showing us is the original audio and how it's being manipulated by the repeats on the left-hand side. In other words, it gets stuck repeating one individual section before it moves on to the next slice. So what time allows us to do is to manipulate this loop as if it was being played back from a tape machine. In other words, we're going to have the opportunity to introduce um, both reversing effects and also pitch offsets as if we were speeding up or slowing down a tape or even playing it backwards. And again, we can do that on a per slice basis. So let's take this first slice for a moment. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to manipulate it. Now, what this allows me to do is to go and find what's referred to as the input beat, which is literally just jumping through the individual slices of the audio. You can see that what this is gonna do therefore is to go and find um, the slice that I go and select because we're looking at that relative to the left-hand side where the audio sort of waveform is happening. As I hover over it, you can see that that's jumping around. And again, what I've got a chance to do is to move from left to right in order to create an offset to the way that this works. And again, uh, quite a lot of manipulation is required to actually make that go where I kind of want it to. Now, negative values from a speed perspective are going to give us a reversed playback. So what I've got a chance to do here again is just to choose individual little speeds for these different nodes, these different sections. And what I've got a chance to do again is to create some variations to it, which are going to, um, again, sort of offset pitch um, and playback speed in different ways. So I've created quite a lot of negative ones. What I'm also going to do is just to create um, some positive upward movement as well. And what we might do as well is introduce a couple of um, curves here as well so that we're in a position to sort of manipulate um, in a non-linear way the way that these sounds are going to work. So I'm just throwing in some shapes at random. Let's see where that takes us. Okay, so there we go. A lot of manipulation of sort of pitch and time now. Okay, so we've had a look around some really important things. Firstly, we understand these different modes, time, repeat, and volume. We have an opportunity to understand the different sort of parameters that are available on a per slice basis. Remember, that's what these are here. We've got a chance to choose the length of the sequence we want to work on. So if I take this up to eight beats, all of these individual slices would become quarter notes across two bars. We've got an opportunity um, to dial in the mix amount that we want. Again, we'll come back to that with pitch in just a moment. But there's also this really useful D clicker. Now, remember, whenever we chop up audio, Imagine this was an audio file, and what I wanted to do was to say, okay, I'm going to take this one slice, I'm going to reverse it. Then effectively, it's really likely that we'd get a click because where those two bits of audio met, we're interrupting those and they're not being managed in terms of how one bit of transient gives way to another. So the D clicker is effectively looking for clicks and it gives us a chance either to retain them all. In other words, if I put in 0%, the D clicker wouldn't work at all. And similarly, if I put in a 100% value, my guess is that what Logic is doing is to apply a real-time um, crossfade. We've looked at fades. We've definitely looked at fades in the video. So effectively, what that's going to be doing is providing, I expect, a kind of equal power crossfade to make sure that the lines as one bit of audio moves to another is just being slightly managed so we don't get clicks. So that's worth knowing about as well. OK, so the next thing to know is that all of these individual slices can be switched on and off. So at the moment, firstly, they can be manipulated. So if I don't want a sort of straight running series of eighth notes, I can move them left and right, which means that I think this would effectively become a 16th note and this would become three 16th notes. A bit of maths required. And a minute ago, I couldn't add 25 and 75. So who am I to be talking about maths? Nevertheless, 
Um, we can move them from left to right to change how long each individual slice is, but we can also get rid of them all together. So if I double click on an individual slice, it will just vanish. And what that basically means is that I could create a shape that lasts for half of my overall pattern before mayhem uh, is kind of introduced on a per slice basis further into the process. So that's a really interesting way of being able to work. Now you'll also notice that down at the bottom here, what we've got a chance to do is, as we have been doing, is creating what's called a custom pattern. In other words, this is a pattern of my choosing, of my making, if you like. But what I can do is to then move through a series of individual presets which exist in these other slots. And effectively, they've all been named and they're available to me. If I want to, what I can do is to um, click here um, and I can select by using this little pencil tool, I've got an opportunity to come down into here and choose a whole series of different presets, all of which have been made around different types of approach. So if I want loops that are kind of going to reorder the slices, well, I can go and find them. If I want to concentrate on repeats or stutter effects or pitch shifts, well, sure enough, there's loads of things here. So effectively, I have a chance to load different presets into my slots. And similarly, I can also save a pattern. So if I want to, I could come back to my custom pattern and I can name it and literally just save it into the list so that it joins these others so that it's something that I can load again. So if I make a pattern that I love and think, okay, I want to be able to use that time and again, absolutely, that's no problem. And obviously the save as is going to give me a name, a chance to name it as well if I like. So that's just enabled here via this little pencil button in the bottom right hand corner. So what we've now got is total carnage. And in fact, I haven't even listened to this because I've turned off some slices. So let's just listen to what we've now got as a result of this strange manipulation. Okay, sure enough, carnage. And you'll notice, by the way, that when I first press play, Logic needs a little bit of time to buffer this before it's calculated exactly what it's going to actually play back. Another good reason to make sure that your tracks start in bar two rather than bar one, so that some of that buffering can happen in a preload way so that you don't lose the first bar of your track if you're working with Beatbreaker. But obviously this is now kind of ridiculous. I'm interested again to come down to a much lower mix value to see how the beat loop sounds with some of this happening in the background. And the answer is better. And I suspect that better is going to be pretty much how it's going to sound most of the time that we work with Beat Breaker because it's, for me at least, a slightly too insistent effect. Okay, so it's called Beat Breaker, right? So it's going to be useful on beats and nothing else. Well, of course, that's not true at all. And obviously, one of the things that we really like to celebrate on this channel is how we might creatively use tools that are designed for one thing on something else. So what I've done. Um, in a slightly sneaky way, is to make this little ambient uh, plucked pattern. I'm going to just mute the drums for a moment. So this is a step sequence, um, which sounds like this. And what I've done is to create a beat breaker pattern, which I'm just going to switch on right now. Again, this is a little custom pattern of my own that I've made using exactly the same techniques that we've just been analyzing. So effectively what I've done is I've spent some time really thinking about how I want these to work. So again, we're looking at the time pain at the moment. Here are the repeats. And uh, you can see that I've got a couple of little volume offsets, including a little riser right at the end in that last slice. Okay, now, ooh, gremlins. Okay, so um, in terms of de-clicking, I've put the mouse here because in this little section here, we've definitely got a click. I'm gonna see whether or not de-click can sort that out. I actually don't know the answer to this. It sounds like I've really rehearsed this. I haven't. This could be a disaster, could be good, who knows? So I'm gonna just press play so you're concentrating on that click and we'll see whether de-click can get rid of it.
is it me or is it different every time? Anyway, it's trying. So there we are. It is what it is. Okay, so there's our D-click. Now again, clearly, this is interesting, but it's overwhelming. But what happens again if we come down to a mixed value of 25%? Well, again, I suspect it's going to be better. This time I am going to let it pre-roll. Let's just press play from here so that we don't lose the first bar. Okay, I'm interested to hear that again with zero D-click. Okay, yeah, that is worse. Well, in a way, that's kind of reassuring. Okay, let's take D-click up to 75%. Okay, so again, we've got most of our sequence back with a little bit of this in the background. Now, I'm going to take the mix up to 50% because, of course, what I was interested to discover was what exactly can be automated when it comes to Beat Breaker. And it turns out that a couple of really useful things can be automated. So the first thing I'm going to do is to open up automation. And I'm going to come to Beat Breaker and I'm going to look at the available parameters. And you might be thinking, oh, that's a bit disappointing. There are only two of them. OK, well, yeah, but one of them is really good. So firstly, what we've got is this mix control. So let's suppose what I wanted to do would be to say, OK, to start with, I want the amount of the um, sort of parallel processing aspect of this. In other words, the volume of the beat breaker pattern to be relatively quiet. And then through the second half, what I want to do is for it to increase exponentially so that by the end, it's having much more of an effect on the pattern. OK, well, absolutely, we can do that. And just to make life a little bit more interesting, I might put a little bit of a ramp there as well into bar three. So that's going to be controlling that mix dial which, as I've already said, I really like. But the other thing that we can manipulate here is the pattern. So in other words, I can switch between all of the available loaded patterns down here at the bottom. So in other words, the names of these are going to be available to me. So if what I want to do is to say, OK, I'm going to create every bar a little offset. I'm going to start with my custom pattern, the one that I made. But what I'm then going to do is to move to another one. I can see that the next one's called Vinyl Drag. OK, so I'm going to move up and sure enough, it's now going to move to this second pattern. Then what I'm going to do is to move to something else. What do I like the name of? Sleight of Hand sounds interesting. Let's go and find that one, which is here. I don't know what that does, but we'll find out. And then right at the end, we'll have a kind of gate and repeat effect, which is one of the last ones that's available here. Now, of course, the thing about this is that I could configure as many patterns as I like. And of course, I can customize all of them. I don't have to use the presets. But what this means is that Beat Breaker is effectively, rather than sticking in one pattern relentlessly over and over and over again, which is going to make our ears bored, it's always on the move going somewhere else. Again, let's give it a little bit of pre-roll. Well, that's a lot of fun, isn't it? So I think that there is an enormous amount of potential in this plugin. We'll be looking at it many, many more times. Uh, next time we might stick some vocals in and see what we can do with that. But I think that this sort of manipulation is has the potential to be really interesting. And there is no getting past the fact that effectively what this is making us um, have access to is a series of controls that we've always had access to. If you want to be able to sort of chop up individual slices in your sampler or even in audio manipulation, breaking audio loops down and chopping them up into individual bits. Well, we've been doing that for a long time. This definitely makes it all a bit easier, but I would definitely be encouraging you to go and find creative ways of applying effects like this kind of in the background as little atmospheric treatments that are just little ear candy details behind the sounds in your productions.